Just a few hours ago, AMD's very own Lisa Su took to the stage to unveil the latest Ryzen 7000 series of processors, as well as to talk about specs, price, and how they perform in a limited capacity of some kind. Now, I'm sure you've all seen tons of news floating around about this announcement, but as always, we want to give our thoughts on things and kind of break it down for you. But before we get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. Hello, mate. You all right? Yeah, just got all the bits from my banging new gaming PC. Just got to put it together. It's going to be so much better than yours. Oh, right. What did you get then? The latest Intel 12th gen processor, a feature packed motherboard and 32 gig of DDR4 memory. See, miles ahead of yours. <laughs> you, you realize that board needs DDR5 memory, don't you? Don't tell me you went and bought the wrong stuff. DDR4 is so 2014. I can't believe you was that stupid. <gasps> what? No, you're joking. What should I get then? For me, I'd be looking at Corsair's newest Vengeance DDR5 kits, or if you're wanting that all important RGB, then go for the Dominator Platinum RGB. Oh, you are a lifesaver, thanks. But where can I find out more? By clicking the link in the description below, of course. <laughs> you call me the stupid one. So we all know that the new 7000 lineup from AMD means a new socket and completely new platform. Now, when I say new, I really mean it, as we see moves being made in every part of the platform from PCI Express to memory and everything in between. Now, because there's kind of a lot to go through, we have actually timestamped this video to make it even easier to get to the bits that you actually want to see. But I do highly advise watching through all of it, as there is actually quite a lot to go through. So first up being the socket itself. While AM4 has made great successes over the years and has been heavily praised for its longevity, AM5 is the new kid on the block. And in a kind of bold twist, we're now seeing AMD make the move to an LGA socket with their main selling point being the ease of installation and the ability to support the next generation of faster devices that support PCI Express 5.0. Now, obviously with a socket change, there's other things at play mainly due to the 1718 pin array, which now actually means support for up to 230 watt TDP processors, a monumentally huge step up from the 105 watt TDP that AM4 offered. What this means for power delivery and efficiency is kind of still yet to be seen, but AMD were keen to say that the new range of processors were extremely power efficient. What this does allow us to speculate on is that for the hardcore overclockers out there, you'll have a and a nice amount of headroom to push things to the limits. And I'm sure as we get closer to launch, we'll be hearing a lot more about that. One saving grace for those upgrading from AM4 is that you'll still be able to use your existing coolers. They're still compatible with AM5. AMD are kind of keen to make the transition as painless as possible. And that's definitely a step in the right direction on at least, you know, keeping consumers happy. Now, staying in line with being known for having longevity across the socket, Today, we also saw confirmation that the AM5 platform will have support through to 2025 plus. Meaning that while we'll see support for the new Zen 4 lineup, we'll also see that follow on to Zen 5 and potentially even see a third generation of desktop processors, or maybe even a refresh like we've seen before with both XT and X3D models of processors. Either way, it's a move that will further cement AMD's position in the market when compared to Intel support which generally only lasts around two years per processor lineup or socket. Now in typical AMD fashion, they've split the motherboards up depending on the features that you actually need. And of course, what your budget allows. Instead of your standard X series boards and B series boards, however, they've been halved again with four major series, which I feel could get a little confusing for say novice users, but we'll see what AMD do to kind of help simplify that at launch. So on the high end, we have X670 and X670E or Extreme. And then we have B650 and B650 Extreme. The main differences here really comes down to PCI Express 5 bandwidth, which on the Extreme boards will give you the ability to utilize both PCI Express 5.0 graphics as well as storage. While the non-Extreme boards will offer slightly better options for let's say the budget conscious with boards starting at $125. The extreme boards, especially when looking at X670E, will cost significantly more due to the extra layers in the PCB and overall better components to aid in supporting more lanes of bandwidth to give performance to both storage and graphics simultaneously. 
Now both the X670 and X670E will be arriving in September, while the B series boards will follow slightly after, around sort of October time. Now while AMD have made transition in, I guess as easy as they can, and in the past we have seen boards sporting both DDR2 and DDR3 on the same board, this time, sadly, we've got no such luck. And as we move to AM5, we see a farewell to DDR4. As unlike Intel, we won't actually be seeing any DDR4 based AM5 boards. And across all four series of boards, we will only have support for DDR5. Which brings me on to, I guess, what was uh, my biggest concern personally. For those of you who remember, AMD's initial Ryzen launch saw its biggest problems revolving around DDR4 memory support. So much so that memory had to be meticulously tested and branded with a Ryzen compatible sticker. Something that Intel seemed to have, I don't know, just got right on every single platform. So with the move to DDR5, I want to admit I was a little bit worried. But after talking to AMD directly at the ASUS motherboard launch at Gamescom, video is on the channel, so definitely check that out, they put my mind at ease and this has now been double confirmed through the announcement, especially with the likes of AMD Expo technology, which allows for apparently one click memory overclocking. I mean, considering the price of DDR5, which still demands a huge premium over DDR4, we've had our fair share of kits pass through our offices that can actually overclock beyond your wildest dreams. What I'm trying to kind of get at is that for those of you who are say budget conscious, this may actually be the way forward if wanting to go with the latest platform without spending unnecessarily and instead spending less and just overclocking with ease. How easy this will be in practice and how many kits will be supported at launch? Well, that's still a mystery, but I guess with anything, time will tell. For now, with the fact that more DDR5 kits are available than ever before due to the kind of time that it's actually had on Intel's Order Lake platform, I'm kind of hopeful that any memory issues won't be nearly as bad as we saw on the original Ryzen. At least we can hope. Now, with the talk of PCI Express 5, the main crux of it will come down to storage which is said to offer, in the beginning, speeds of around 13,000 megabytes a second read and 12,000 megabytes a second write, but will of course get slightly faster as the technology kind of matures a little bit. It's said that the first set of drives will be around in November, and much like when Gen 4 drives initially launched, they will come with a premium. And being honest, for gamers, they're not really gonna offer no noticeable difference, while content creators everywhere will be rejoicing. Okay. So socket and motherboards out the way. The reason you're here in the first place comes down to one thing, the CPU themselves. Now, a total of four processors were announced for launch, which will come on September the 27th for a range of users and budgets alike. These are the world's first five nanometer desktop CPUs. And one thing that I found the most interesting is that all the processors being launched, of which you know, more will come at a later date, now feature integrated graphics as standard. Maybe with the fact that AMD's new 7000 GPUs are coming later on, they simply wanted a way of, I don't know, grabbing customers with the hope that they'd buy their graphics solution at a later date, instead of swarming to the competition. Or, I don't know, maybe they just simply found a way to put this feature into the processors in a kind of discreet manner, while not taking away from the core performance of the CPUs. Who knows? So with four models launching on September the 27th, there seems to be something for everyone. Starting with the Ryzen 5 7600X, offering up 6 cores and 12 threads at a base clock of 4.7GHz, boosting up to 5.3GHz and with a TDP of 105 watts. I mean, yeah, it does sound like this could be the new value for money king, especially as its price point comes in at $299, which admittedly is more than what the 5600X came in at for launch, but if the IPC improvements that we will talk about and that what AMD are already talking about is anything to go by, may just be worth it. In terms of the cache, the 7600X comes with 6 mega of L2 cache and 32 megabytes of L3 cache. Moving up stack to the Ryzen 7 7700X is where we find 8 cores and 16 threads operating at 4.5 gigahertz, with a boost clock of up to 5.4 gigahertz features a slightly beefier cache of 8 megabytes of L2 while keeping the same 32 megabytes of L3 cache and the same TDP of 105 watts as the Ryzen 5. Pricing wise, the Ryzen 7 will come in at $399 US, which again is $100 more than its predecessor. Moving further up again and things start to get very serious with the Ryzen 9 7900X coming in with 12 cores and a whopping 24 threads, running at 4.7 GHz on the base and up to 5.6 GHz on the boost clock. 
The cache has been significantly bumped up on this one with 12 megabytes of L2 cache and a stonking 64 megabytes of L3 cache. Along with these impressive numbers, the TDP sits at 170 watts, which while it sounds high is actually still lower than the maximum turbo power of the 12700K from Intel. One area where it does break the mold comes down to the price as it's actually launching with the same $549 launch price that the 5900X did back in 2020. And finally, the beast, the daddy, the flagship 7950X, which is coming sporting 16 cores, 32 threads, and a base speed of 4.5 gigahertz. While the boost, which is something AMD were keen to shout about, goes all the way up to 5.7 gigahertz. The cache has been dulled up to 11 with 16 megabytes of L2 cache and 64 megabytes of L3 cache. Comes in with the same TDP of 170 watts, which again is much lower than the max turbo TDP of Intel's 12900K. Though specs on the 13900K are still kind of yet to be seen, so who knows? Pricing wise, AMD have come in hard at 699 US dollars, which compared to the 5950X when that launched, is actually a saving of $100. Though compared to current pricing, it does actually demand a premium. I guess by the looks of things, AMD wants to give savings on the higher skewed models when comparing to the rest of the stack. But this does actually allow AMD to bring out other models at a later date, including something maybe like a 7600G with stronger graphics, because while all the launch models do include onboard graphics, with a simplistic core count of just two cores and a base clock of 400 megahertz, it's more kind of aimed at those needing to do desktop work or troubleshooting. What I'm trying to say is that even Nvidia's terrible GTX 1630 actually has a chance of finally winning something here. Wow. <laughs> What could be more interesting in the future is while all models here are branded with the X denotation, maybe we could actually see something in the future with no overclocking and more aimed at the budget conscious. Though as we've seen in the past, these may actually be region specific. So I'm just kind of speculating at the moment. Either way, if Ryzen 5000 was anything to go by, some of the lower end models could actually be very interesting to see. And something that could rival the likes of Intel's 12100 and 12400 SKUs and of course the upcoming 13th gen variants. So what about performance and how will things compare to the current gen lineup? Well, we all know that AMD love to talk about single core performance and multi-core performance for differing reasons. One comes down to gaming and one comes down to hardcore multitasking through creation and productivity. And in typical AMD fashion, they absolutely love the acronym IPC or instructions per clock. Now we all know that Ryzen 5000 saw a huge IPC uplift compared to the generation before, and through lots of hard work, AMD have actually managed to introduce a similar gain again, with a 13% uplift in IPC on single core performance over the last generation. Through a fixed core frequency of 4GHz on the 8 core 16 thread SKUs on both Zen 3 and Zen 4, they were keen to show this performance uplift across a variety of software application and games. Now, while some gave smaller increases than others, we did actually see some of the hottest games of the last year, including Far Cry 6, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and F122, pushing between 12 and 19% increases when looking at the Geo mean. Now, AMD also claimed up to 29% total single core performance gain when compared to Ryzen 5000, which while that, I guess, sounds impressive, it's mainly down to the boost frequency that the range now has due to the new architecture and of course now being manufactured on the new 5 nanometer process node compared to 7 nanometer that we saw on Ryzen 5000 series. AMD also showed both gaming performance and creative performance at 1080p on both the 7950X and the 5950X to show again that they have the best processor on the market. And while numbers are always nice to see, when looking at the games tested being Dota 2, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Borderlands 3 and CSGO. Yeah, I think you're best off waiting for the likes of us to, you know, actually review it and test it and show you what it can do in titles that matter. Also, what GPU was being used for these tests? There's still just so many unanswered questions. Now comparing performance to performance when looking at each generation is one thing, but what I was keen to see was the performance when compared to the 12th generation processors from Intel, because we all know that that is where the competition is. And with 13th gen coming, well, yeah, that's a whole different story. One way that AMD wanted to show that they had the upper hand compared to Intel was in V-Ray, where they showed a gain in performance of over 62% when compared to the Intel 12900K. I mean, that's impressive, but what happened to Cinebench? 
This was something that was typically used in the past by all brands involved. But what I'm trying to get at, and I'm not accusing AMD of it, but cherry picking titles that make your product look great is easy. Everyone does it. So again, I'd advise waiting to see what us and other reviewers come up in a variety of tests so that you have a better picture presented to you. Okay, so lots of information to take in. And while I've tried to cover the main focus points, I definitely advise looking at the AMD stream because there's actually some smaller information that you may want to look at that didn't really, I guess, warrant explaining here. So with that aside, I think it's worth giving AMD some brownie points where it's due because the stream as a whole was actually very good. It gave information and confirmation on a variety of areas, not just with the CPUs, but for the socket, the platform, the longevity, and so much more. The processors themselves are pretty much what I expected, though the huge cache is, I guess, a welcome bonus. And it'll be interesting to see how that, I guess, has an effect in a huge amount of gaming titles, and more importantly, in creation and productivity software. Now, one part when it comes to gaming that I'm actually really interested in, that they didn't even really talk about, is how things compare to the latest CPU in the Ryzen 5000 series lineup. Yep, I'm talking about the 5800X3D. I mean, come on. We all know that money aside, it is the best gaming processor on the planet. That's currently released. Yeah, we'll go with that. So how does Ryzen 7000 as a series actually stack up against it? Especially on the lower end, like the 7600X. And talking of the 7600X, I was actually a bit disappointed on its price point and honestly expected something more. And it wouldn't surprise me if it actually sees a price cut somewhere in its life cycle, depending on the adoption rate. But I guess with that, time will tell. What is nice to see is, let's call it level playing field competition. With AMD making the move to AM5 along with DDR5 adoption and PCI Express 5 across both storage and graphics, we now have competition that could really heat up. And like I always say, there's only ever really going to be one winner when it comes to that. And that's you, the consumer, because you'll actually have choice between AMD and Intel and pricing should theoretically come along with that too. Obviously, we have more information on the upcoming Ryzen processors as we get closer to the launch date. And as always, we will have a ton, and I mean a ton of content around them, as well as the boards and everything else that goes with it. So let me know in the comments section below what you want to see, as we can make so much content on this stuff and compare against this and compare against that. So let us know what you're most looking forward to, or join our Discord and let us know there. The link for that is down below, where you can join our community and it's an amazing community of over 4,000 members to chat and play games with. So with that, hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, a like and a sub to the channel would be amazing. And if you love what we do, consider supporting us over on Patreon, where you'll get access to exclusive behind the scenes content, bi-weekly game nights, and access to all of our testing data. The link for that is down below. And yeah, I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.